Well, this morning we're going to uh, actually end a, I guess, subsection of the series that series that we've been in on sanctification, uh, dealing specifically with the relationship of faith and sanctification. Uh, there were plenty of passages that I considered uh, going to for this morning. Uh, we haven't even touched really Hebrews eleven which is a, such a significant passage describing the relationship of faith to the believer's growth and holiness and how God uses faith to sustain us as he has saints throughout history. Uh, but one thing that has been on my mind uh, for this series and just throughout as I'm trying to devour uh, various books uh, on the subject uh, I wanted to to actually recommend and critique uh, several resources uh, before the the series is over, and so uh, with a, pl- a plethora of passages in mind and books, I, I I'm going to try and combine those things this morning. Um, this morning we're going to look at five accompaniments to sanctifying faith. That's the the title for this morning's message, five accompaniments to sanctifying faith. And what we'll do as we look at these five things that always accompany the saving and sanctifying faith that God uses to grow us. What I want to do is uh, just weave throughout this message uh, quotes from two books. So these two books, uh, Free to Be Holy, a liberating, The Liberating Grace of Walking by Faith is a book I would strongly recommend. If you have not read this, I think we have a, a couple more copies at the book table and several more coming. But this is an excellent uh, resource as well as expository sanctification. Um, Paul Shirley authored both of these books and co-authored Free to Be Holy with Jerry Rag. So Free to Be Holy and Expository Sanctification. I'm going to be uh, quoting extensively um, from those two books this morning. Uh, the, just a, a word about each of these resources. Free to Be Holy is really uh, Jerry Rag and Paul Shirley's response to the the culture, Christian culture of our day and the way that typically people are thinking about this doctrine. Um, maybe you, you aren't aware, but there were some um, heated discussions happening uh, several years ago on the Gospel Coalition blog between two of their platformed bloggers uh, and uh, Tulian Tavijan and Kevin DeYoung were in this uh, intense and extensive debate about the nature of sanctification. And um, just by virtue of Kevin DeYoung still being qualified for ministry, I think that his, uh, that he kind of won that debate um, just by his life mirroring the godliness that Tulian Tavision claimed uh, that his ideas about sanctification would accomplish. Um, This book, Free to Be Holy, really puts forward, I think, the strongest case for what we've talked about over the past few weeks, that faith is the lever on which sanctification turns. Um, It really, the the primary duty of the, the Christian in sanctification is to vigorously pursue holiness from a heart of faith, a heart that believes God. And there's no other resource uh, beyond free to be holy that I think captures and just teaches so well, so thoroughly on that very theme. So that's a a, a recommendation uh, for you as well as expository sanctification. Uh, What's unique about expository sanctification in keeping with the title is that it ties together uh, these two crucial areas of the Christian's life, sanctification and expositional preaching or expository preaching. And so it explains what preaching 
has to do with sanctification. Uh, that was a central reading in my mind for the uh, core team who is planting a church in New Orleans. And so this month, actually last night at our core team gathering, we discussed that book. Um, our core, all the members in our core team uh, read that book and uh, are, are better acquainted with how to think about preaching. And that is just a, some good pressure for me uh, l- endeavoring to go to New Orleans to know that everybody knows that their godliness is um, in a significant way dependent on what happens uh, when I preach in New Orleans and I wouldn't have it any other way. So that's uh, those are two excellent resources. And this morning, as we think about uh, closing this particular emphasis on faith in sanctification, what I want to do is just consider five things that accompany genuine, uh, effective, sanctifying faith. We've been talking about this over the past few weeks that the Christian must set his sights on believing God above all else. And from that submissive, genuine faith in Christ is going to flow good works. Good works are going to abound as the believer faithfully pursues uh, obedience uh, from a heart that entrust itself to what God has said is true. And so the following graces will always accompany saving, sanctifying faith. And so I've got five of them for us this morning, five graces that will always accompany saving, sanctifying faith. And you'll, you'll just have to listen. I don't have an outline for you this morning. Uh, that's going to be up. I'm calling these things graces uh, and the five things are, are grace itself, humility, sincerity, knowledge, and effort. Grace, humility, sincerity, knowledge, and effort. These five graces always accompany saving and sanctifying faith. And I'm calling these things graces because they are graces in the sense that they are derived ultimately from God himself, uh, from God's kindness to us as sinners. These things do not come, they are, are not accompaniments to faith because we've ultimately figured these things out or because we have the power to make them effective in our lives or to ensure that they appear alongside faith in our lives. Um, We are in some measure responsible for many of these things to cultivate them in our lives, to pursue them. But at the same time, we are not ultimately responsible for their appearance in our lives. God's grace our own humility, our own sincerity and knowledge and effort in the Christian life is not ultimately of our own doing. These things are ultimately from God himself. And so wherever God is kindly at work in the sinner's life, you can expect these things to be evident in some measure and not to compare ourselves with ourselves because there, these things are evident in different measures in our lives. Um, You probably wouldn't want your, your own humility uh, put up against a Scott or Sarah Demarest, right? Um, I don't want that. You don't want that. And so the point is, not to compare ourselves, but rather that these things, grace, humility, sincerity, knowledge, and effort are all present in the believer's life as they exercise belief in God, faith in God that will indeed sanctify. And so for starters, just to, as we, as we look at these five things to just start off emphasizing again, the very nature of faith. We've talked about this over the past few weeks, so this will be familiar territory, but 
Jerry Rag and, and Paul Shirley helpfully uh, define faith in this way in free to be holy. They say grounded upon the God who cannot lie. Faith is the act of entrusting ourselves to the truth. God has spoken. It is to rest upon what God has promised solely because of who he is. That is what faith is. It is just taking God at his word. And because you believe him, therefore responding in a way that demonstrates you believe him, i.e. entrusting yourself wholly to him. Just because you believe he is trustworthy. You don't need any other verification. You don't need a sign. Faith is taking God at his word. And so because the one who spoke these words possesses a trustworthy character, he is faithful. Who he says he is and what he does are perfectly consistent. Therefore, you believe him. You take him at his word. This is what faith is. They also say faith is both the first responsibility of the Christian life and the continuing imperative of Christian living. This is what we've been saying. This faith initiates for the Christian uh, the salvation that brings us into submission to Christ, uh, everything available, all the resources available to us in the Christian life. Faith is the initial step into all of those things. And it's the continuing imperative, as they say, of Christian living. And so faith is never something that we graduate from. It is always relevant, always necessary. I appreciate this articulation of, of faith from these men. Uh, they go on and they say faith, not sight. Faith, not sight summarizes the entire Christian life. Citing second Corinthians five, seven walking by faith, walking by sight, excuse me, walking by sight is natural and easy. It takes little work to live without faith. Man intuitively lives according to his senses rather than God's promises. It is hard not to let feelings, experiences, and circumstances determine your perspective of reality when you can see them so clearly. Go to 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Smed just preached at length on this for a number of weeks recently. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul is setting the sights of his readers firmly on eternity. He is giving them a perspective of this life in the here and now in view of eternity. And that is uh, obviously a stabilizing perspective for the Christian this is how we avoid changing with the winds of our ever-changing circumstances, is to have an eternal perspective. So look at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Paul says, therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight, we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. This is the eternal perspective on life here. We make it our ambition, whether we're at home or away, whether in heaven with the Lord or here remaining, to be found pleasing to the Lord, to glorify him. 
and all of that, we make that our ambition in light of the coming judgment, knowing that there is a day coming when God will judge all of our deeds, whether good or evil. Uh, We began this series early on looking at the same principle from Ecclesiastes 12. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, Solomon says, The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole entire singular duty of man. Why? For God, verse 14, will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So this is man's entire duty. You can sum up all of life under this singular heading, fear God and keep his commandments. And this is what Paul is identifying. What we have our sights set on that enables us to go after that singular pursuit in this life is eternity, eternal things, things that can't be seen. They can't be felt. They can't be held. They're not tangible. They can't be tasted. They're not an emotion. We must train ourselves as Christians to live by those things. That's walking by faith, not by sight. And what free to be holy, what that volume does so well is it just highlights that the Christian cannot live by his senses, even feeling holy, feeling sanctified, feeling near God, feeling like the truth is having an effect on your soul means absolutely nothing. So what if you feel those things? What does that actually mean? Nothing before God. You must believe God, not the way you feel. You might feel sanctified, feel like you desire God one day, and then you wake up the next morning and you have to start all over again. You don't feel the same way. And because you know it's right, because you know it's good, because you know God's words are inherently desirable above gold, even much fine gold, Psalm 19 says they're sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. What do you do? I'm just going to go read my Bible because I am believing God that he's going to use it to sanctify me. Not because I feel like reading. And even when I find myself in a book like first Chronicles or a prophet where I don't know what's going on, I'm going to keep plugging away and reading anyway, because by faith, I know God is going to work out these truths in my life and try and just derive some benefit. God is true. God's words are desirable. That has a tremendous effect over the long haul when the Christian, just out of a sense of obligation, duty, I am just believing God, recognizing that I'm a creature who's duty bound to God and saved by his grace. I'm obligated to him now as a recipient of his grace. I should just walk in a manner commensurate with what he's told me to do. Over the long haul, that has a sanctifying effect, even if, unfortunately, you don't understand what you're reading that morning. Because you are coming to God's word from a heart of faith saying, even when I don't understand, I believe him more than the limitations of my understanding. And that's good for us. So over time, you read that passage, you know, your Bible reading plan for the 10th time, and I've never understood that. And then all of a sudden that morning, I'm back in Jeremiah 23 and all of 10 years worth of sermons and 10 years worth of Bible reading. And now I'm back in that passage and all of a sudden I'm benefiting in ways that I didn't think I would in ways that I hadn't the previous nine years. And so God slowly trains us to be patient and to just trust him. That's good for us. That is what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. That anything that I can tangibly sense or understand or lay hold of with my own natural resources, I'm not trusting in those things. And so with that, these, with that faith, with that pursuit of faith in mind, 
These five graces always accompany that kind of commitment to the Lord. Here we go. Number one, grace itself. Grace itself, obviously, is a grace from God. Grace. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. This grace is necessary beginning in salvation and continuing in sanctification. Beginning in salvation and continuing in sanctification, grace is absolutely necessary. Possibly no passage demonstrates that, articulates that better than Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, where Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. This salvation that came through faith, that is the grace, the salvation, the faith. This is a package deal. It is a gift of God. Verse 9, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Could be translated, we are his work, worked in Christ Jesus for good works. These are good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So the entirety of salvation from your conversion by grace through faith, all the way through throughout the Christian life, every single good work that you carefully walk in, God has orchestrated all of it. He has overseen the process from beginning to end. He indeed is the author and finisher of our faith. He prepared the good works and he is the one who ultimately causes us to walk in them. Philippians 2. We desire to do God's good work. Um, He works in us both to will and to work according to his good pleasure is what Paul says in verse 13. It is God who is at work in you. Philippians 2 13, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is all of grace. So grace is the first accompanying grace to sanctifying faith, wherever sanctifying faith is exercised, you can just take it to the bank. It is God who is at work in you. It is because of God's kindness. You have him to thank him to praise him to worship because of any sanctifying faith that you exercise. And so worship him. When you see God's sanctifying uh, work in another believer, in your spouse, in your children, Tell them, I am so thankful to the Lord for what I see him doing in you. Do you realize uh, that submission that you just exercised, child or wife in a moment? That's of the Lord. Tell your, your friends in your small group, wow, the way that you are exercising transparency, the benefit you're deriving from God's word, the ways that I see you bringing your thoughts into submission to his word. That's evidence that God's grace is at work in you. Worship him and boast together in what he's doing in, in you among one another. We should be in the habit of doing that. Again, Jerry Rag and Paul Shirley say multiple problems arise from not understanding grace properly. Some are defeated by sin through poor discipline and patterns of weakness so that they become despondent and simply give in to temptation more frequently. In order to minimize guilt, they begin to downplay the seriousness of sin, railing against rules and turning grace into freedom to indulge. God is gracious, they say. He'll forgive me or... God knows my weakness and he accepts the way I live because he's big enough to handle my messy Christianity. Have you ever heard that? 
from people claiming to believe God's grace. Oh, we're just messy as an excuse to just not take sin seriously, not practice church discipline, perhaps. This is a wrong understanding of God's grace. The grace that saves is the grace that sanctifies. And so we should hold both of those with a white knuckle grip that both salvation and sanctification are the result of God's grace at work in a life. Again, uh, regarding this disciplined uh, pursuit of God's grace, we even call them the means of grace. Hopefully that's a familiar term to you, the means of grace. Just the spiritual disciplines like prayer, Bible Bible reading, serving, um, evangelism. Those things are means by which God imparts renewed grace into our lives uh, and causes spiritual growth. Some people would like to downplay the Christian's role in pursuing God's grace. And here's what Paul Shirley says in expository sanctification about that. The process of spiritual growth does not elevate us above the need for grace. It plunges us deeper into the storehouses of grace in the pursuit of holiness. Since we can't sanctify ourselves, any talk about progress, growth, or maturation must occur in the context of grace. Sanctification is built upon a foundation of grace with materials provided by grace. So to talk about exertion in pursuing grace is to actually rely further on God who provides it. God has ordained the means. We don't determine the ways that we grow even. God has spelled them out in scripture. And so because he has clearly identified the things we must go after to grow, then to actually go after those means of growth is another way of saying, I believe God. I'm not going to seek to grow on my own terms. How has God said I need to grow? I'm going to submit to his plan for my growth. This is why you're here at equipping hour, is it not? The second accompanying grace or the second grace accompanying sanctifying faith is humility. Humility. And humility is demonstrated in a couple of ways. The humility that I'm, that I'm thinking about specifically is demonstrated in a distrust of self and displayed in a confidence in God. In the Christian life, humility is shown in these, at least these couple of ways, a growing distrust of self and a growing confidence in God. Just consider how fundamental this principle, this grace, humility, is to the Christian life at all. This is a part of the entrance into the Christian life. When the Christian exercises saving faith, is that not a form of humility? Think about 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. I love this passage. Because it's so black and white. And there's no way around being in one of these categories that Paul identifies. 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. See how black and white that is? The gospel comes and it only ever comes to one of two people. It comes to one who perceives it as foolishness and that person is perishing. Or it comes to one who is being saved and he perceives it as the power of God. One person hears God's 
powerful message to save, the gospel, and says that indeed is the power of God. He agrees with God that that is powerful to save. Or he foolishly disagrees with God and calls God a fool and says what God has said saves the gospel. That's foolishness. And every Christian in the room, if you are a believer, was one day in that boat. You heard the gospel, and before you believed it, you thought, that's ridiculous. Maybe not in those terms, but you refused to believe it. And when God says, this will save you, you foolishly disagreed with God, and you called God a liar. And you said, that won't save me. I can save myself another way. We all Christians, we have all said this. That is arrogant. That is not humble. To agree with God is the essence of humility. And this is why it's an initial mark of conversion. To humble yourself under the mighty hand of God in the gospel and to agree with him finally, no, God is true. All other men are liars. That's humble. Just think about the, the, the way this quality, even in the book of Proverbs, becomes a foundational gateway, really, into all wisdom. All wisdom. To receive any degree of wisdom requires this humility. The humility that would agree with God, not trust myself, and say, God is the arbiter of wisdom, not my own mind. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. Fools, fools despise wisdom and instruction. Foolishness is a V, preeminent learning disability. It prevents you from re- receiving any wisdom whatsoever that God has to offer. Foolishness, a refusal to submit my own mind to the Lord, to say, I trust him more than I trust self. That's why the very next verse, the first commandment in the entire book, which is regularly repeated in Proverbs is, listen, hear. It's the Hebrew way of saying, let your ears receive these words with a heart eager to obey them. Hear, Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Shema in Deuteronomy. This is that same word. Listen, let your ears be attentive with a heart that is eager to submit to what what you're hearing. That kind of humility is basic to faith. And where that kind of humility is lacking, faith is impossible. No one will believe God who is unwilling to distrust self. So long as you trust self, you will never believe God. Consider the the basic instructions in Proverbs 3, 5, and 7. Trust in Yahweh with some of your heart? No, no. Trust in Yahweh with all of your heart. Everything I have, every ounce of trust and reliance that I can muster that belongs to me, I am handing over to the Lord. So I don't trust me with anything that God has spoken on. He gets my thoughts. He gets my feelings and my emotions. He gets my decisions. He gets my will. He gets my friendships. He gets my job. He gets my marriage. He gets my parenting, everything submitted to his wisdom. That's the essence of faith. Anyone who's withholding any of those things just doesn't trust the Lord yet. Now we all falter. No one does that perfectly, but anyone who's admittedly, yeah, Jesus can have some things, but not others does not know Jesus yet. They have not called him Lord. Trust in Yahweh with all of your heart and do not lean 
on your own understanding. Some helpful parallelism there. Just look at the contrast. Contrary to leaning on your own understanding is trusting Yahweh with what? All of you. To not trust him with all of you is to lean on your own understanding still. Children, you must forsake your own understanding. If God has given you parents that articulate his truth, then you must trust them because, not because they're so inherently trustworthy, but because you trust God. And anyone communicating his truth is worthy of being believed. Do not lean on your own understanding. Verse 7 says it another way. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. Again, it's a helpful contrast because contrary to being wise in your own eyes is fearing the Lord and turning away from evil. Or to say it another way, turning away from evil, what's required to turn away from evil is to fear the Lord and not be wise in your own eyes. The moment you insist on being right in your own eyes, you have forsaken any chance you have of not turning away from evil. To be wise in our own eyes enslaves us to continually doing evil. We must possess the kind of spirit produced humility that makes us distrust self and only display confidence in God's opinion. By faith, we hold on to the certainty that God who transcends our feelings, experiences, and circumstances is the one who determines reality. Think about that. It is by faith, these authors say, that we hold on to the certainty that God who transcends our feelings, experiences, and circumstances, he is the one who determines reality. So his truth, they say, is true even when it doesn't feel right. His will is ultimate even when our experiences seem determinative. His hand is mighty even when our circumstances seem omnipotent. His character is holy even when our emotions betray us. His promises are final even when despair seems permanent. Regardless of how things seem to the Christian, the one who is walking by faith is training himself to not trust how things seem to him, but rather to rely solely on what God has said is true. That is what it means to walk by faith. And that requires humility. So wherever sanctifying faith is present, you can count on it. Grace and humility will be present as well. Also, sincerity, number three. Sincerity is a grace that always accompanies saving and sanctifying faith. Specifically, uh, a sincerity or without hypocrisy when it comes to our fear of God, our hatred of sin, and our pursuit of righteousness. Only faith can sincerely fear God, can sincerely hate sin, and can sincerely pursue righteousness. Just consider some passages, Proverbs 8.13, for starters, the way these things sort of go together in one verse. The fear of Yahweh, Proverbs 8.13, the fear of Yahweh is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. This is wisdom speaking. God's wisdom personified says the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Just put an equal sign between those two things. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. Where you and I do not properly hate our sin, it is because we do not fear the Lord as we ought. Those things go hand in hand that way. Wherever you're counseling one another, and you just see a 
inadequate hatred of sin in your brother, a belittling of the seriousness of sin in each other, just seek to answer the question, seek to help one another. Where is there a fear of God lacking? What is the particular character quality of God that this brother of mine needs help focusing on? Is it his sovereignty? Is it his lordship, his authority, his presence, his power, his grace, his mercy, his love? All of those, everything about God will will help us grow in a hatred of sin. Without this sincerity, a true faith, a sincere faith, as Paul calls it in 1 Timothy 1.5, without this, any pursuit of sanctification is just eye service before men. This is why Jesus had to remind his disciples and the crowd present in the Sermon on the Mount that you need a righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees. Because they just had a fake righteousness, a hypocritical righteousness, a righteousness that was content to look like righteousness before men. As long as men were pleased, then they were pleased. Their prayers didn't go past the ceiling. So they, did, they prayed in front of everybody, ostentatious prayers, so that people went, wow, look how holy they are. They gave publicly so people could say, look how sacrificial they are. They looked like they were fasting in front of people so that people would be impressed with them. And if that's why you're righteous, then God cares nothing for that brand of righteousness that you possess. So when it comes to a fear of God, a hatred of sin, a pursuit of righteousness, the only kind of faith that would do those things is one that's accompanied by genuineness or sincerity. Even repentance in 2 Corinthians 7, the first mark of, a, of godly sorrow that produces repentance, that a, a, um, accompany, accompanies re, genuine repentance, the first mark in that list is earnestness. You must be earnest. That means I don't care what anybody else thinks. I don't care the shame that this might bring. I don't care how this looks to anybody else. I don't care how extreme this seems. I don't care how foolish I might look for not having, you know, the same access to freedoms that other people can have in their Christian liberties. I'm going to get rid of whatever I must. I'm going to confess whatever I must so that I can lay hold of true repentance that requires sincerity. Number four, knowledge also is a grace that accompanies sanctifying faith. Knowledge, this, this should be obvious, knowledge of the truth must accompany, accompany saving and sanctifying faith. Uh, You can't obey more than you know. You can't believe more than you know. And so to remain ignorant is a kind of unbelief just by virtue of the fact that you're not believing what's true because you don't know it. We are all ignorant to some degree, but the Christian life should be characterized by a pursuit of knowledge Not the knowledge that puffs puffs up, but a knowledge that because I am more aware of what God says is true, then I have more to obey. Praise God. I can more effectively look like Jesus. Here's another quote from Free to Be Holy. A person cannot submit to that which he does not understand. This is why the truth must be systematically understood in order to be sanctifying. If you want to grow in your faith, you must understand the substance of your faith. Sanctifying transformation 
requires an understanding of the truth of the Bible. And then an expository sanctification, speaking specifically of God's character. Paul Shirley says, as we increasingly fill our minds with the glory of God, we will increasingly desire to mortify the sin that falls short of God's glory. So all things biblical, God's character, the gospel, the nature of man, how sanctification works, even the future. We must know these things so that we can grow in ways that God intends. Even thinking about this, this area of knowledge, uh, not only knowledge of the truth, but knowledge specifically of your own heart. That's also important. To have a knowledge of what's outside of Scripture now, but what Scripture sufficiently tells you about your own heart, Scripture gives us all of the tools to adequately diagnose what's happening within us at the heart level. And so each of us, we have as many differences between our hearts as there are people in the room and more. And so we need to be aware of ourselves in particular. Having that knowledge is even helpful to pursuing sanctification by faith. So, for example, a list of questions that may differ among each of us when it comes to thinking about our own hearts. What lies am I prone to believe personally? What lies? What's the struggle with sin and the lies that I am just, I tend to believe more easily than others? The answers might differ between us. Your friend might be prone to different temptations than you to unbelief and doubt in different ways than you. So you need to know yourself. Another question, where does my thinking easily go astray? What attributes of God am I most prone to doubt or disregard in the midst of trials and temptations? It's helpful to know those things. Do I most easily forget his love for me? Do I most easily forget his omnipresence, that he's here? Do I most easily forget his sovereignty and control of these circumstances? Also, at what times of day is my heart most vulnerable to temptation? Sometimes that matters. And sometimes (laughs) physical normalities like eating and drinking affect us, affect us at even at in the heart in different ways. So if you're like me and you shouldn't eat as much grains or you get tired. And when I get tired, I'm more prone to anger and impatience or whatever. Then I need to be aware of those things. Everybody doesn't possess the same uh, hindrances. Some of you can eat lots of sourdough and be fine. That happened last night. If you haven't tasted Pam Robinson sourdough, you should. Um, Another another final area uh, to just think carefully about, another grace that accompanies sanctifying faith is finally effort. Effort. A striving to pursue godliness, that is indeed a grace from God. As we've already seen in Ephesians chapter 2, he predestined these good works for us to walk in. And so when we actually walk in those good works, all the glory goes to him. But also in Ephesians 6, just look at Ephesians 6. That famous section on the armor of God. We can often forget in the the language of, of the armor, the various pieces, that they come with imperatives, things for us to go do with them. 
Look at verse 10, Ephesians 6. Finally, before any of the armor is discussed, you have this command. Be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. It's a lot of strong words. Strong, strength, might. The Lord is strong and in his strong strength, you be strong. So take courage, be strong, verse 11, then put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, since That's where our battle lies. Take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm, stand firm. Therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints and on my behalf as well, etc. I mean, this is just laden with obligatory language. You be strong. You put on the full armor of God. You stand. You take up the full armor so that you will be able to resist. You stand firm. And the idea is that you stand firm in verse 14 Having done all these things, as you do, or these things are the the means by which you actually stand firm, by armoring up with the things listed. That does take effort to resist temptations from within and from without. These evil forces at work, we must be armored up, being strong. I mean, this takes tremendous effort. This is war language. You don't roll out of bed uh, and just go about your day on a leisurely stroll, progressing in sanctification. But this is war. It takes effort and work and strengthening, divine strengthening, divine weaponry to be successful. And so effort is in no way contrary to, to the grace that we need. Shirley says this, God has not promised to mystically mature you as you recite the gospel to yourself. Maturity comes as we actively expose ourselves to the means of grace God has revealed to us. So even though you're sleepy, maybe, when you open your Bible, realize This is war. This is war. This is a fight for my soul to lay hold of God's means of grace. And by his kindness, Lord, please make this effective in my life, even though I'm sleepy and don't desire it as I ought to right now. Would you just overcome my weaknesses and my own ability and make this accomplish in me what I could never do on my own? That should, that's our prayer dependent on the spirit, asking God, just please use this in some way that I I couldn't accomplish. One more quote from free to be holy as a, a way of thinking about sanctification. That is not uh, one of the, the helpful aspects of this book is that 
it just dispels the notion that Christians could actually run too hard after obedience. When you're weary in your obedience, the problem is never the commands of God. And for a second, just, just think about the absurdity of that thought. Are you really saying that, that God's commandments are a burden to you? Was he unkind when he commanded you to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect? Was that just bad advice? <laughs> is perfection just too high a standard for me to attain and that's causing my weariness? No. Jesus says his yoke is light. It's easy. John said the commandments are not burdensome. The problem's never with the commands. The standard's never too, too high. The weakness is in us. And so the solution, quote, the solution to self-atoning tendencies is not to stop vigorously pursuing righteousness, but to stop trusting in it. Stop trusting in a vigorous pursuit of righteousness is the point. And in the same way, the solution to patterns of failure is not to stop denying self, but to stop blaming unbelief on the commands we find hard to obey. The power of the spirit against the flesh is not accessed by merely recalling that we're saved by grace. It is ignited, the power of the spirit against the flesh, is ignited by entrusting ourselves to God at the very moment our flesh is crying out for satisfaction. And since obeying the will of Christ is the only sure proof of genuine faith, then we must always fight discouragement, not with less striving, but with greater faith-filled effort. And may that be the testimony of all of us here at Grace Bible Church. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for these truths, for the promise that your grace will have its way with us, that you will one day uh, sanctify us completely in body, soul, and spirit, and we will perfectly, in the inner man and externally, look conformed in, in all of our life to the image of your Son. And with that in view, I pray that you would make us strive well, make us run hard, and may we be an encouragement to one another in the same race. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.